We'd now like to invite Faith Baisden, the manager of First Languages Australia, and Jennifer Knifton, a committee member of First Languages Australia from Western Australia, to discuss their perspectives. So thanks, Thank Faith and Jennifer. Thanks, Carmel and Jingiwala Jimbalung. Um, First Languages Australia is the peak body for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander languages working to support the goals of community language programs around Australia and to ensure the strength of our languages into the future. The information that we've heard today paints a picture of the sheer determination of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to keep their languages from disappearing. The only reason they haven't disappeared is because of the commitment, imagination and the integrity of the language custodians. Basically, progress if it has happened, has been horrendously slow and in truth catastrophic because it's increasingly overshadowed by the death of the speaking elders. The Australian government has expressed its intention to see a significant increase in the strength of and support for our languages to meet the targets of the closing the gap. Our network of language communities has given us clear instruction on the best way for government to do this. Firstly, Australia must have in place legislation to reinstate and protect first languages into the future. There must be legislation so that any commitment negotiated with one government can't be discarded once that government changes. Those of us who've been working in this field for decades have provided countless submissions, responses to reviews, inquiries, round tables, and presentation to government departments, which could all be avoided if we had legislation that respects the right of people to use their own language as they wish. To reach the point where people can speak their language in this country, it has to be first reinstated and restored to functional use. The current government funding for 69 languages other than English, but not Indigenous, is estimated to be well over $200 million per year. The funding to support around 200 active Indigenous languages in Australia is 12.4 million per year. This is the discrete amount to support the 20 language centres, the peak body, as well as the training and resource providers. There is an additional 7.6 million that is shared with arts projects that include a language component. We want to make clear that we commend the work of the Indigenous Languages and Arts National Program, which manages the budget that's currently available from the government. We know they can't do a loaves and fishes with the funds they have, but hopefully the, these discussions will give the government the tools they need to support the introduction of realistic and equitable funding for first languages. We're also really pleased with the efforts of the ILA team to engage other departments. So we'd just like to show you here some global funding comparisons. Canada also has a small population and almost exactly mirrors our situation in terms of the issues for its first languages. The Canadian government committed $335 million to be spent on first languages over five years from 2019. This is to be increased and maintained at $116 million a year from 2023, and that's to support 70 languages. So the figures equate to around $62,000 per language in Australia and a projected $1,650,000 per language in Canada, with legislation in planning to protect that into the future. Jennifer Knifton has been the manager of Bundiara Irrawonga Language Centre in Geraldton, and she'll talk now about the role of the language centres. You there, Jennifer? Hello everyone. Um, yeah, so looking at the 20 language centres in Australia, the funded language centres, they're providing an enormous range of activities and services to their communities and to government departments. However, the level they are funded at means they don't have the capacity to plan and survive in the future as a genuine service provider. The reports that we have heard today have highlighted the critical limitations of the current funding levels, which for most centres have not increased in over six years. 
There are therefore no career pathways for people who work in languages and with that no opportunity for capacity building in this area that's rich in science, education, history and art. So many employment opportunities are missed in these areas as well as in health, justice, social services and tourism. So if we look at the, the number of language centres across Australia, we can easily provide justification for multi-million dollar funding for language centres by cataloguing the calls for information and resources that they are now fielding. Since the rollout of the National Curriculum for Indigenous Languages in 2016, the language centres have been swamped with calls from teachers for information and resources. Some language centres have literally hundreds of teachers who are actively interested in accessing materials to teach the languages. The language centres aren't funded to handle this work. It must be slotted in between other work and relies on volunteer support. This is work for the government in the education sector and it's unpaid. Did you know that there are individual language centres that are responsible for the revitalisation, documentation, resource production and teaching of over 40 and up to 70 languages? Does that sound feasible in anyone's world or would it ju not, just make, uh, not just make an ordinary person give up? In 2014, First Languages began a campaign to promote awareness of the pleasure that our languages are to the general public. Prior to our campaign, knowledge of the number and diversity of languages was nearly non-existent outside of the areas of anthropology and linguistics. We knew that before we could convince the government of the need for action to protect the languages we have, to have the general public convinced of the same thing as the public elects the government. We consider that this awareness campaign has been hugely successful and as we've nego negotiated agreements to see our language incorporated or promoted in the following. So if you look at some of the promotional partners um, that we had in first languages. The slide shows the range of television, radio and major institutions that have taken up the partnership with us to promote languages. However, the sting in the tail of this success is the drain that is placed on the language centres. Television, radio, print and online media have been soaking up their time and expertise for content for hundreds of videos and online stories for the recording of radio station calls or language lessons for media broadcasters. While on the one hand it's a cause for celebration, it's a huge drain on the language centres and another unpaid service that ultimately benefits all Australians and their government. FLA is trying to make sure that whatever we introduce people to meet, whenever we introduce people to media for these activities, that we negotiate payment for their time. In the lead up to the time when we have legislation and a sustainable level of funding, for first languages, there are a number of actions that need to be taken to help to meet the targets set in outcome 16 of CTG, closing the gap. The government urgently needs to extend its delivery of services in our languages beyond the sphere of arts and culture. If it wants to make any significant change, language is not just a heritage item. The first steps towards cross-government responsibility for languages can be seen in the Commonwealth Department of Education, Skills and Employment Indigenous Languages Project, aimed at developing a national strategy for the teaching of first languages and the development of resources. The project will involve the National Languages Network, communities and all peer stakeholders and will be completed in 2022. I'll hand you over to Faith. Thanks, Jennifer. Well, the action of this Commonwealth Department, the Department of Education, Skills and Employment, to develop a national strategy for first languages must be replicated across government. The Department of Health currently provides translated resources for its national bowel cancer program in 27 languages other than English, but not for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander languages. 
The, on, the only first language translations on the Department of Health site are for COVID. The Services Australia site managing Centrelink, Medicare and child support provided, provides translated resources for 70 community languages. There are no Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander languages on their drop down list. They're all ethnic or migrant. How critical is it and how basic that information and services for families and children, seniors, housing and mental health be delivered in appropriate language to the people accessing the services. In the area of law and justice, the government must ensure that no Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander person faces court, mediation or the back of a police van without the appropriate services to support their language needs. No person should be subjected to judgments, actions and decisions that will affect his or her life without access to a full understanding of what's being said to them. Strong languages will also provide numerous other opportunities for government, as Justine touched on. There are growing numbers of successful cultural tourism ventures around Australia, which meet the genuine hunger for knowledge of the international visitors to Australia about the languages of this land. There's an obvious pathway for career development in environmental management. Every local government in Australia will soon be needing the knowledge of local language speakers so a structured pathway for people with skills in this area should be developed now ahead of a, a looming need. The commitment of the government to outcome 16 is commended. While no target numbers were given around outcome 16, we're keen to see the improvements described and to help set targets that match the words. As the document says, an increase in the number of people accessing language centres which will of course mean proper funding for those language centres. We're keen to work on a national policy and in the shortest time possible to see legislation in place to protect our languages. As we said at the beginning, the first language speakers of this country have displayed commitment, imagination and integrity in keeping their languages alive. We're asking the government now to step up and do the same. Thank you. Thank you. Very big thank you to Faith and Jennifer.